Our last time in the Gospel of Luke, we were studying the transfiguration of Christ. And what's interesting is this account that we're about to read is found in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it is found in them all after the transfiguration, something to note indeed. We're going to consider the theme today of when Jesus' followers fail him, because the reality is for all of us in this room, it's not if we fail, The real reality is when we fail, we all are going to blow it at times. And we're going to see that very clearly in the life of the followers of Christ after the mountaintop experience. So hear with me the word of the Lord, Luke 9, beginning in verse 37. Scripture says, Now it happened on the next day after the Mount of Transfiguration that when they came down from the mountain a large crowd met Jesus. And behold, a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only one, my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth, And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling or destroying or shattering him as it leaves. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving, you faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Now, while he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground, throwing him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished, marveling, amazed at the majesty, the greatness of God. But while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus was doing, he said to his disciples, put these words into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the statement, and it was concealed, hidden from them, so they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. This is the word of the Lord. You just left the most wonderful worship service. You never felt closer to God than you did that Sunday morning. The music was inspirational to your heart. You felt like the pastor that morning had written that message just with you in mind. You had truly met with God on this Sunday. And then you get into the car with your family and a nuclear war breaks out within one minute of leaving the parking lot. You immediately say things you will later regret in a way that undoes everything you had just felt a few minutes earlier. And you feel absolutely powerless to calm the raging storm that has erupted in your home. You just had a great time in worship in God's Word on Tuesday morning. You've been doing good after church, and Monday was a pretty good day following Christ. You've been on what seems like a mountaintop until you clock in for work that morning. And you are spiritually in the clouds until that one coworker pushes just the right button. And everything you have felt feels like it is forsaken. We call this failure. Webster's defines failure as a deficiency, an insufficiency, a declining and decay. The idea of sinking down and becoming weaker and deficient in duty and omitting and neglecting and missing and not having the effect you wanted. It is not being successful. Instead, undoing everything that seems to be right. I want to say to you again this morning, it's not if you fail, it is when you fail. And the reality is the church... And when I say that, I mean the church like all of us corporately, but also 
personally and individually will never be immune to mistakes and fiascos and botches and falls. We're all going to blow it. We're going to say something insensitive or ridiculous. You may already be guilty this morning. We are going to post something shameful and unbiblical. We are going to act contrary to our faith. On the night Jesus was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, his very closest friends and followers slumber when they should be sleeping, when they should be praying, they're sleeping. Peter whips out a sword and tries to cut the head off of one of his enemies. Thankfully, he had bad aim that night. They all abandoned Jesus. And then by oath, three times, Peter denies he ever knew Jesus. It is not if you are going to fail, it's when you are going to fail. So today, let's look at this example of when Jesus' followers fail and see how we can learn from this account. You'll notice in verse 37, the time of this event is given. It is the day after the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, John, James went up to the mountain. They saw the glory, the majesty of Jesus. They saw Elijah and Moses. They heard the voice of God the Father. They got a taste of glory. It was the most amazing moment so far of Jesus' earthly life. And they come down from the mountain, this mountaintop of closeness to God, to a devastating scene. And you can't find a more contrasted section in the Bible, then Luke 9 and the verses before 37 to 45 and what happens here. The scene dramatically shifts from this beautiful taste of heaven to the reality of the sin-cursed world we live in. You literally go in this passage from glory on the mountain to a terrible tragedy down in the valley of this world. On the mountain, Jesus displays his glorious majesty. And yet, here in the valley, we see Satan showing his tyranny, his violence, his cruelty. Jesus' light is fading when they come down from the mountain, and now darkness has engulfed the world. We get a vision of glory, and then a battle of Satan. We have Elijah and Elisha, and now we have a demon and crowds and Mark's account says even a bunch of teachers of the law arguing with Jesus' disciples. We leave the voice of God testifying, Jesus is my beloved son, listen to him. And now we have the voice of a desperate father pleading for his only distraught son. This is a great contrast that is made to make us pause, to think, and to learn together. Now, if you remember from those sermons earlier in the Gospel of Luke, we saw in Luke 9 that Jesus is seen as kind of a greater Moses, a greater Elijah, as he's up on the mountain. And I think there is another Moses typology here. I think God is trying to draw us back to what happened in Moses' day and show us that Jesus is greater than Moses. Why do I say that? Because when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, just like as Jesus comes down from this mountain, after Moses had seen the glory of God, his face was shining, he comes down from the mountain and he finds the people of Israel faithless. He finds them in confusion. In fact, one great New Testament scholar, Patrick Schreiner, has written here, he says that Luke is noting that the demon throws the boy down to the ground and shatters him. And I inserted these words, mauls him, crushes him. The same verb that was describing the shattering of the tablets. When Moses comes down from the mountain, he finds Israel worshiping the golden calf, faithless, and he shatters the tablets. Jesus calls these people here in Luke 9 a perverse and faithless generation, a phrase that is exactly what God calls Israel in the wilderness. Don't miss the parallel here. I just introductory, I want you to be thinking in this way as we study this passage. Now, right away, I think we should realize all of life is not a mountaintop experience. That's kind of a duh, right? But it it sometimes is worthy of being reminded of. 
Listen, we often hear so much positive, prosperity, blessing. You know, you can just think big, dream large. Everything is going to work out. You know, the life is a bed of roses uh, theology. And the reality is there are mountaintop experiences, but they are not the majority of the Christian life. The battle of life is a war. There's a war raging around us even this very morning. You don't have to go very far to see it, to find it, or to feel it in your bones if your eyes are open. It is a reality. And as Jesus comes down from the mountain, we see just that. There's this large crowd here. Uh, Mark's gospel tells us there's a bunch of the teachers of the law, the scribes, arguing with the nine disciples who did not go up the mountain. And we have a broken-hearted father pleading for his son. Notice a, a man from the crowd comes shouting. Matthew Gospel tells us he's also, he falls down on his knees before Jesus. He is crying out. Listen, this is not like, uh, dear Jesus, can you please help me? This is a passionate pleading to God. The word shouted here, it's the same word that is used when Jesus shouts from the cross with a loud voice. Now, he begs Jesus, Jesus, look on my son with pity, with compassion, with love, with care. Have mercy on my son. I want to pause for a minute and ask you, do you have the kind of eyes that Jesus has in this passage? I think one of the failures of the followers of Christ is we often don't look at the world with the eyes of God. And this is, in fact, a problem. Maybe the problem the nine disciples had at the bottom of the mountain. You see, in Ephesians chapter 1, we are told that when we become believers of Christ, the eyes of our heart have been enlightened. We are supposed to see this world differently. We are to see people differently, see our families differently, see our neighbors differently, see the suffering around us differently. If you walk lockstep with CNN and Fox News and how you see the world, you might have a problem. If you walk lock and step with the way the unrighteous, those who hate God, see the world, your eyes might have some blinders in front of them. We are to see people and see the suffering around us differently. Now, what I love here is that one compassionate look from Jesus can set everything right. And I would just challenge you, do your eyes see like Jesus' eyes? Look at my son. He is my one and only child. How interesting that is, just like Jesus is the one and only, right? the unique Son of God. In the same way, this is the one and only child of this father. This little boy never had brothers or sisters to play with. This was the only relative of this man. And I think Luke's gospel spends a lot of time on purpose showing us the importance of children and how we see the world. When I read this here, I'm reminded in Luke 7 of the widow's only son at Nain that Jesus rescues. And then in Luke chapter 8, in our last series in Luke, the daughter of Jairus, who is his only daughter. And you think about maybe in John's gospel of the nobleman's son at Capernaum and the children that Jesus takes up in his hands and he prays. I want you to note here today that just like parents love their children, our enemy, the devil, has a bullseye on every child in this room and in this world. Read this text and recognize there is a war against children. Children are a battleground. Don't think there is neutrality when it comes to the children of this church the children God has placed in your life. Every home is a battleground. Every church that is alive and functioning with screams and crying and wiggles in the pews is a battleground. 
1 Kings 18, I'm reminded of Elijah saying to the people of Israel, how long are you going to go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord, if Yahweh is your God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. All of these examples in the Gospels are an antidote to the idea that it is useless to teach the Christian faith to children. It, it, they all are an antidote to the foolish idea that children are simply neutral and we need to allow them to make their own decisions. When you read a text like this, we see that idea is from the devil and it is not from Christ. There is a war raging for the souls of children. And in verse 39, we see how the devil raises this war. Too many are limping between two opinions. They're not taking seriously the calling. Listen, parents of teenagers, your children are in a battle right now. Parents with little ones in the home, we have an enemy who wants to devour them. You only get 18 years at best, right? Time is critical. Every day counts. Our enemy, the devil, through his demon, verse 39, seizes the child. The child is tormented by him. He cries out early from a young age. Our enemy has been against this boy. There's a lesson here. And that is, if Satan begins so early to do harm to our children, we must also begin early to lead them with diligence to Christ. Brothers and sisters, these evil spirits in the world, yes, there is evil in the world. Yes, there are demonic forces, fallen angels. They are called demons. They are spiritual beings at work trying to, to bring chaos and death in the world. When you see the heinous crimes committed, the murders, the assassinations, look, less than a mile down the street from my house this very week, it was shown that a man killed his wife, and I mean, I walk by the house all the time, killed his wife, and then killed his dog, right? This happened this week. This is not simply the anger of man. There is demonic spiritual war in the world. Our enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. When people are trying to assassinate leaders, when people are trying to destroy children with life-altering hormones and surgeries, when people are literally indoctrinating children with demonic lies, from as young as they can get their minds to believe a lie. You better believe there are spiritual forces at work in the world. Friends, when you read this here, we must recognize that the evil in this world is utterly undone, and these demons will do everything in their power to utterly undo you. It is their whole business. They are depraved and they want their depravity, they want hell itself to spread throughout our world and in the lives of others. Now, the conditions of this young man, this boy, well, the old King James called him a lunatic. Yet the descriptions very much fit the disease of epilepsy. He has seizures. He foams at the mouth. He has convulsions. Now, the word lunatic has come from this because the Greek word here has the idea of being moonstruck. There is a tradition that uh, there are demonic forces at work when there is a full moon in the world. The Bible never says that, but there is definitely um, some correlation and patterns that have led to this kind of thinking. Now, we need to be careful on this point. These kind of texts do not say that people that have sickness or diseases are demonic. Epilepsy is a real disease. It has nothing to do with demon possession. However, we must recognize that Satan, when he demonically oppresses someone, when demons do this, they can physically bring sickness. They can physically attack the body as well as the soul. 
Just like in the story of Job. Just like in the story of the demoniac of Gadara. This boy shows these kind of signs. On top of it, Mark tells us he was also deaf and he was mute and he would only cry out when he has these kind of seizure-like activities. Now, in this boy's case, he was being tormented. He was, in fact, possessed, controlled by a demon. Listen, we all have bodies, but we also have souls, right? C.S. Lewis once said, you are not a body, you are a soul that has a body. And this body is, can be possessed. It will either be controlled, your soul and body will either be controlled by God, or it can be controlled by demons. And whether you have trusted in Christ or not determines whether you are open up to these kind of demonic attacks or even possession. This boy was, in fact, demonically possessed. And Matthew 17 tells us the father says, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures. He suffers terribly. He often even falls into the fire and into the water. I want you to note that this demon was trying to end the child's life, to literally kill him. He must have had great scarring on his body from often falling into the fire. He must have maybe almost drowned multiple times in his life. Literally, think about the sentence this brought on the father, and if there was a mother, the mother, and that the parents had to always, 24-7, care for this child because the child's life was in continual danger. And then you'll notice it says that the, the, uh, the boy would be mauled, shattered, as crushed as the demon leaves him. One writer has said, out of hell there could be no greater misery than for a father to watch their child suffer so terribly. How sad this situation is. Now, Matthew's gospel tells us, of course, three, three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, went up on the mountain, but nine of them stayed below. And evidently, this father had come to these nine disciples and had pleaded with them to remove this demon out of his son, and they failed. They were unable to do it. This tells us something, because they had been able to remove demons before. The Gospel of Luke chapter 9 begins with the disciples being sent out and casting out demons. And yet here they could not. This tells us there is an order to the power of demons. There are some that are stronger than others. There are some demonic forces that are more powerful, have more control than others. Hence, they commit more evil. They bring more suffering in the world. We know that there's more powerful angels than others, right? There are angels in the world. We have lead angels, archangels. We have cherubim. We have seraphim. There's different types of angels that do different work for God. And it seems in the same way, there are different types of these fallen angels, demons. And this particular demon was too much for these nine disciples to cast out on their own. Now, I want to pause for a minute and think with you. There are thousands of young people in the world today, and they may not have been affected physically with epilepsy. This is just one occurrence of one way a demon could, in fact, attack somebody. But, while they may not have the physical impairments, they are under the oppression, the attack of demons. 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 26 says this, it, it is a prayer that those who are not saved could come to their senses, notice this, and escape the snare, the chains, the bondage of the devil, because they have been captured by him to do his will. We have a generation in America who do not know God. We have a generation in our country today that have no respect for the word of God or the law of God. They serve their own pleasures alone. They do not listen to the advice of their parents, the counsel and wisdom of their parents, their teachers, 
They don't have pastors who teach them the Bible. They fling aside all regard for their health, for their well-being, for their character. They don't care what they do to their body. They don't care what people think of their character. And they do not care at all about their eternal soul. They are doing everything that lies in their power to ruin themselves for eternity. They are willing servants of Satan. To those of you who are children in the room, teenagers in the room, and those of you who are parents in the room, you students, I want you to listen. There is a reason why your parents are constantly warning you about who you spend time with, about who your friends are, right? Because there are so many that are given over openly to evil. And the Bible says that we should not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scornful. The Bible warns us to flee lust and darkness, to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Your parents care about you because they recognize that you are still wet cement, and it's easier for their evil to rub off on you than for your good to rub off on them. That's why there's boundaries in our homes. And by the way, parent, if you are not protecting your children and you're letting them run with those who are in the snare and the bondage of the devil, and you are letting them have the primary dominant influence, and you are letting school systems that are teaching the worldview, the bondage of the devil, be the primary influence, and you are not doing the work of discipleship in your children's lives and homes, and if you are letting your children be discipled by YouTube and Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram and whatever else, right, there is danger in your home right now because you are letting all kinds, you are letting the floodgates of demonic possession and oppression have influence on those who mean the most to you. There are many parents in this room today who weep over the sons who they once loved so much and honored so much and had so much hope in, who are now wasting their lives away as companions of fools and sinners. And daughters who were once the flowers of the family, who parents said these children will comfort us in our old age, who are now lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Our children have so much going against them in this world. Now, I have a study from 10 years ago. Now, can we all agree the world's changed a lot in 10 years? A whole lot, right? But it's from 10 years ago. It was done by John Hopkins University. And this is what it said. It said 30 years ago, so that would be 40 years ago now, the five greatest fears of grade school children in the world, children in elementary school and middle school, what are their five greatest fears 40 years ago? Animals, being in a dark room, high places, strangers, and loud noises, okay? Ten years ago, the five greatest dangers were, they were most afraid of, number one, divorce. I don't think that's on the radar anymore because people don't get married anymore. Nuclear war, cancer, Pollution, and number five, being violently assaulted. Top things kids worry about 10 years ago. What would be the list today, I wonder? How grievous it is to think that our enemy, the devil, is working overtime in this world, isn't he? He is working overtime, and we live in a generation that is given over to this very thing. So I speak that in a prophetic way to warn you to take seriously the evil and darkness that surrounds us. This is not a joke. It's not a joke. Eternal souls are on the line. Now, look with me as we continue on. Verse 40, the father says, I begged your disciples to cast the demon out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Jesus is the last chance this father has. Even the followers of Jesus failed 
in this. They could not cast the demon out. Brothers and sisters, this is a reminder, a humbling reminder that without Jesus, we can do nothing. Listen, there are evil forces in this world, and you will not outwit them. You will not outsmart them. You don't have more plays in your playbook than they have. All right? You, your confidence in yourself is not going to do it. Listen, just because you go to church on Sunday doesn't mean that you're going to be victorious over the wickedness in our society. Just because you get your presidential candidate in the White House is no promise or guarantee that evil will not continue to reign in this world. Not for one minute. I love what the Methodist preacher Samuel Chadwick said. He said the church that is man-managed instead of God-governed is doomed to failure. And a ministry that is college-trained but not spirit-filled will work no miracles. We need God's Holy Spirit. We need dependence on God. For some reason, the nine were more dependent on other things rather than God. They were faithless instead of faithful. They were weak when they should have found their strength in Christ. They were relying on the wrong things, whether it was the past, whether it was the training they received, whether it was simply their own strength. Brothers and sisters, when we read this here, we see how we have victory over evil. If you're a parent in the room, if you're a grandparent in the room, oh, this father should be your example. We must bring our children to Jesus. And I don't mean on Sunday morning. I mean every day of the week. I didn't say lead them to sports to be great athletes. Lead them to YouTube to keep them busy. Lead them to music to get them skilled. I said our number one responsibility to overcome the darkness of this world with the light of Christ is to bring them to Jesus. And those of you with little ones in the room, little babies who are making a lot of noise, it is never too soon to pray for those children, to work for those children, to begin teaching those children to tell them of God, to tell them of Christ, to tell them of right and wrong. The devil loses no time to do it. We must lose no time to invest in our children. J.C. Ryle said, The child of many prayers will seldom be cast away. God's time of conversion may not be our time. He may think it fit to prove to show the reality of our faith by keeping us waiting a long time. But as long as our child is living and a parent is praying, we have no right to despair over our child's soul. Some of you have what we call prodigals. We have sons and daughters that have walked far from God. I want to encourage you today, if they are still alive, Jesus is still on the throne and prayer can still change things. You can continue to pray. Continue to bring them to Jesus in your heart. Continue when you have phone conversations. Continue when you have time with them to let the light of Christ shine in them. It is best to start young, but if you didn't start young, it is best to start now. It is never too late to pour into them the light of Christ and bring them to Christ in prayer. You can hear the pain in Jesus' heart in verse 41. As he says, you faithless. It's interesting. The Greek word for faith is pistuo. And in Greek, it's a pistos. A, no. Literally, you no faith and perverse generation, perverse race of people. You people today, this is the same thing that Moses said in Deuteronomy. Remember what he said about the generation of his day when he came down from the mountain and he found them committing idolatry. 
You are an unbelieving people. Well, I'll serve God one day. I'll give to God when all my bills are paid. I'll live for God when I've retired. I'll stay faithful to my wife when I get older. One day, I'll stop looking at that garbage on my phone. One day, I'll get involved in the church. One day, we'll stop living together and get married when we've got enough money. Did you ever stop to think the storm you're walking through is because you're not walking with the Lord rightly? Did you ever think that if you just stepped out in faith, you would stop sinking? And that Jesus would grab you and pull you up out of the troubled, disturbed waters that are engulfing your very soul. Brothers and sisters, faithlessness fills the followers of Christ. They are faithless here, so they are powerless here. They are perverse, he says. The word here means twisted, bent out of shape. We are supposed to live, Philippians 2 says, blameless and innocent in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Yet too many of us, our morals, listen to me, our morals, our beliefs, our lifestyles look more like the United States of America's kingdom than they look like God's kingdom. Too many of us call right wrong and wrong right because we have been shaped by what the world says which literally a generation back would have been called absolute insanity. Two plus two still equals four. Truth is still truth. And it's the only thing that'll set you free. And so, we see here perverse. I mean, look at the world today. Literally, the Olympics are going on. Uh, We saw the opening of the Olympics literally was with a bunch of drag queens, transgender people, putting on a a little show that was to look like Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, blaspheming Jesus Christ and the gospel. And to top it off, they had a little child at the table showing who their target audience is, who they're going for. All right? Christians should be talking about this. I saw cowardly Christians online saying, oh, believers, you should not be upset about this. Really, zeal for God's house has smitten my soul. Zeal for the glory of God in the name of God has broken me. Tell that to the prophets and the apostles and every righteous man or woman who has ever walked the earth. Oh, we should be ashamed brokenhearted. It should burn inside of us a zeal to reach this lost generation with the gospel of Christ. They don't know God. They hate him. That's what that was a statement of. We hate God. We hate Jesus Christ. We hate light. I mean, da Vinci's depiction is actually a corrupt depiction, but it doesn't matter. They don't know any better. They are lost in darkness. And they are perverse. So, Luke's gospel does not record this, but I want to read to you what Mark's gospel says that the Father prays, because I think this is a prayer we need in a perverse and crooked generation. This is a prayer we need to pray every day, I think. Immediately after Jesus said these words, the boy's father cried out and was saying, I do believe, help my unbelief. What do we do when we have unbelief? We resist it and we pray against it. What do we do when we don't know what to do? We ask God to fill us with more faith. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something God gives us. Lord, increase my faith. I am weak. I am trembling. I am doubting. I feel overwhelmed. I feel overrun. I feel feeble. Don't wait until your faith is great and mighty and perfect. When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like the darkness is surrounding you, that's when you go to Christ. This is when you pray for more faith. We use the faith we have and we resist our unbelief. Oh God, I don't want the darkness of the world to puff the light of Christ out. God, I want to pray with more faith that hundreds of more souls will be saved in this church. 
that old animosities that have kept us separated from one another and bitter against one another to be removed. I want to pray, God, when it seems like the marriage can't be turned around, that my marriage will be reconciled. I want to pray, God, that children who are running from home will come home. I want to pray that the slavery to sin in my life would be once and for all conquered by the cross. God, I want to pray that my disinterest in prayer would be replaced by a vibrant joy in praying to God. I want to pray, God, that my lukewarm worship, my fear to even open my mouth, will be replaced by a boldness for the glory of God. Read the book of Acts. When Jesus' name was undone, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. And with great boldness, they said, neither is there salvation in any other. They were told, stop speaking in Jesus' name or go to jail. And you know what? They preached all the more harder. They let the light of Christ shine regardless of what the world says. So we've got to end. Look at verses 42 and 43. Now, while he was still approaching, the demon, one last try, one last show of power, slammed the boy to the ground, threw him into a compulsion. Sounds like a boxer dealing a knockout blow, doesn't it? Sounds like a wrestler throwing someone to the ground to try to finish them off. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the boy This is such a tender statement. And he gave him back to his father. And they were all astonished at the majesty of God. And everyone was marveling at all he was doing. Brothers and sisters, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus rebukes demons. He rebukes fevers. He rebukes the winds and the waves. He unmasks. He exposes He terrifies evil. He has full power over the darkness and over the fallen angels. Listen, he is the one who cast the fallen angels out of heaven. And he is the one who will one day throw Satan and the demons into the lake of fire for eternity. As it has been said, when the devil reminds us of our past and our failures, remind him of his future. Remind him he is a defeated foe. Go to Christ. Take your children to Christ. Plead your home and your soul before Christ Jesus. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Jesus saved this boy to the uttermost. He restored him. This boy now has no fear of being thrown into the fire or the water. No fear of being shattered on the ground. He could now worship Christ with his all. He was a new creation. And if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And the old has passed away and the new has come. And it's so beautiful. What does it say? He gave the boy back to his father. Jesus is more than just a miracle worker. Do you hear the tenderness in that? The boy was lost. But Jesus' heart is seen here just as much as Jesus' power. He raises him. He lifts him to his feet. And with his heart, he restores this child. And don't miss what Luke says here. Everyone is astonished at the majesty of God. Because Jesus is God. When Jesus works, God works. What was visible to the three on the mountain is now visible to the multitude here as Jesus has saved and changed this boy's life forever. And everyone marveled over it. His name is wonderful. It's marvelous. Friends, I want to say to you as we close, Jesus and his majesty is around us today. His majesty is in this room. If a young man in his 20s or his 30s has walked into the doors today, full of unbelief, sin in his heart, darkness battling for his soul, and today 
He says, I surrender. I need to be made new. I am not going to go with the perverse and crooked darkness of this world. I need the light of Christ, and he is saved. Today, the majesty of Jesus will be felt in a person whose marriage has failed, is recently divorced, has been caught up in a crooked, tangled web, but today receives the touch of Jesus and is lifted up by Jesus and restored and made new. And it will be seen in the man who is marvelously set free from his addiction to alcohol as he says, no more, I am dying to that sin and living for Christ and will follow him with his all. And it is seen in a six-year-old little girl in this room who says, yes, there is evil in this world, but I will follow Jesus. And in her heart right now, she tenderly cries out to the Father, I'm coming to you, Jesus. I'm coming to you, save me. And his majesty is seen when anyone comes into Christ and is made a new creation. A few years ago, a man rushed through a museum in Amsterdam, and he found a very famous painting of Rembrandt called Night Watch. And he took out a knife, and he slashed it repeatedly until someone finally came in security and stopped him. A short time later, a distraught man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome with a hammer and smashed one of Michelangelo's sculptures. Two cherished works of art were severely damaged by two men. What did the officials do? Did they throw them out? Forget about them, say they are lost cases, they are no more. They found the best experts. They worked with the utmost care and precision. They made every effort, and they restored the painting, and they restored the sculpture, these treasures. Even after Satan has had his way with us, if we come to Christ, he will restore us. He will give us back our lives, our souls, and we will live with him forevermore. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer.